post-launch session. So uh, today I'll be talking a little bit more about the strengths and weaknesses of quantum examples for, examples for learning. So let me just give a quick recap of one slide of what we saw yesterday, and then I start from there. Good. So yesterday we saw this packed learning model. So there is this concept class. That's a collection of Boolean functions. There is this distribution D. That's just a distribution on n-bit strings. And the concept class is known to everybody. The distribution is unknown. And in classical packed learning, you're going to get x comma c of x's. This is an n plus 1 bit string, where x is sampled from this distribution d. And in quantum packed learning, you're going to get this coherent superposition examples of x comma c of x's, where the amplitudes are square root d of x. And the goal in uh, both quantum packed learning and classical packed learning is for every concept in the concept class and for every distribution d on n bit strings. The goal is, in the classical case, to obtain these labeled examples. In the quantum case, these quantum examples. The output a H, a hypothesis that is close to C when measured according to the distribution D. And the main theorem that we proved yesterday, yesterday using the pretty good measurement was, if you look at the PAC model of learning, where you need to work well for every concept and for every distribution, the quantum sample complexity is equal to the classical sample complexity. So we saw that quantum examples, even given to a quantum computer, are not more useful than classical examples given to a classical computer. In this very, you could call it a strict model of learning, but it's something that classical learning theory people care a lot about. Good, but uh, like I said, I got, many got, I got many questions yesterday, and they were, let me try to address the main questions that I got yesterday, and a few of them were, okay, the distribution under which the quantum pack learning had to, we proved the lower bound against, was unnatural. Like, Okay, sure, you want to prove a hardness, this makes sense, but the distribution you proved it under was just unnatural. Maybe that's not how nature works. What if D is nicer? And um, let's just say for simplicity, what if D is just a uniform superposition? So then the question would be, just if D is a uniform superposition over n-bit strings, then this is just 1 over square root 2 to the n, that's just this. So quantum examples are this, and classical examples stay the same, but x is just drawn from the uniform distribution now. So the first question is, are quantum examples better than classical examples? Say when I fix the distribution to be D. So this is, in learning theory, this is called the distribution dependent model of learning. And one more question I got was, okay, let's just say, for example, I didn't get like a labeled example, x comma c of x. What if I choose to query the unknown function c? So here we always assume that c is unknown, but coming from script c, and somebody chooses an x comma c of x and gives it to me. But what if, supposing I could query it on some point y that I like? I query it on y1, I get c of y1, I get y2, and then I get c of y2. Maybe then our quantum query is more useful than classical queries. Good. So um, the main idea today will be to actually talk about the strengths and weaknesses of these quantum examples compared to classical examples. I'll give you some positive results, and then I'll give you some negative results. And then I'll talk of the relation between quantum and classical query complexity of learning. And before I get to this, let me first, I don't think many people got to the third problem in the problem session yesterday, but I think this is a very interesting problem and it's a cute problem, so I think I'd like to talk about it first. It's called the coupon collector problem. So you have n coupons labeled one to n. Uh, the question is, let's just say I have n coupons in my hand. I just pick a uniformly random coupon and give it to you. You see, for example, seven, you give it back to me. So again, I have n coupons. I pick another uniformly random coupon. I give it to you. You see four. The question is, how many times do we need to repeat the sampling process before you see all possible coupons from 1 to n? So this is a pretty fundamental problem in 101 computer science. And the right answer is n log n. So you need to repeat the sampling process n log n many times before you see all the coupons from 1 to n. So let me change the problem a little bit here. And so let's just say there are still n coupons. But let's just say there is a fixed one coupon that I choose. Let me call that coupon I star. And I take that coupon from the n coupons, I keep it on the table. So in my hand, I have only n minus one coupons, and there's one coupon on the table. Now the question is from the n minus one coupons in my hand, how many coupons do I need to keep picking from these n minus one coupons? I keep giving it back to you. And the question is your goal is to find what is the coupon on the table right now. So again, there are n minus one coupons. You know that one coupon is missing, it's on the table. How many samples from this n minus one coupons do you need to take before you realize what is the missing coupon I star that I picked out and kept it on the table? And the goal is to learn I star. The same analysis almost about from coupon collector shows that n log n is the right answer. So you need to pick n log n many samples from this n minus one coupons before you realize what is the coupon that was missing in my hand. So what do you do being quantum? You look at quantum coupons. So what's a quantum coupon? Let's just consider this uniform superposition state. So there are n minus 1 coupons in my hand. 
So it's just a uniform solution over n minus one items. I'm just removing the one item i star, which is on the table, and I'm just going to call this thing ket i star, or a quantum coupon. And the question is, how many quantum coupons? For example, so this quantum coupon is just a fixed quantum state i star, ket i star. I keep giving you this fixed quantum state i star. How many different quantum coupons do you need before you realize what's i star? So realize, I call it i star because that's the only thing missing in the superposition. And the surprising answer is, it, uh, the right answer is theta of n. So it's surprisingly log n better than this, but it's just log n, that may not surprise you, but given the fact that coupon collector is such a fundamental problem, the fact that you can get a log n improvement is kind of interesting. And the reason why I like this application is um, the following. Um, so the way, you, the way you show this upper bound is pretty simple. So you just look at, I give, let's just say I give you t copies of this, so this is my i star to the power t, and then you have to do state identification now because I need to learn what's the missing I star. Like I said yesterday, if you want to do state identification, hit it with a pretty good measurement. But the only observation here is like, if you write down the gram matrix for this pretty good measurement, these inner products are actually very nice and they can, e so you can diagonalize it easily. So yesterday I kind of misled you into saying that, okay, pretty good measurement is useful always for state identification, but there is a caveat in that. The fact is you need to always take the square root of the gram matrix, which could not be easy all the time. You need to find the eigenvalues of it. But it so happens for this example, diagonalizing the gram matrix is easy. And if you just diagonalize the gram matrix, write down the success probability, and just plug in t equals the order of n, you realize that the pretty good measurement has success probability at least two-thirds, which means that that's the close to the optimal success probability. So the, okay, this is, I think, a cute problem and a cute application of the pretty good measurement. But as far as I know, this is one of the only quantum speedups that I know, which is not based on Fourier sampling. And that's what I'm going to be coming to in the next part of the talk. So like almost all known quantum speedups for learning are kind of based on this technique called Fourier sampling, which I'll talk about next. This is one of the few examples which I know which don't go via Fourier sampling, and you just hit it with a pretty good measurement and it seems to work. Any questions? Good. So let's talk about Fourier sampling. Right, so what's Fourier sampling? So think of this, let me first define what's the Fourier decomposition and then talk of Fourier sampling. So C is just a Boolean function that maps n bits to minus one comma one. I just do minus one one for simplicity. Uh, then the Fourier coefficients are just given by this formula. And if this formula is kind of intimidating, you can just think of this as the inner product between C and the parity function, the normalized inner product. So for every S in zero, one to the n, I can define the Fourier coefficients this way. And there's something beautiful called the Parseval's identity that says that, okay, fine, you have this Boolean function, maps n bit strings to minus one comma one, Look at the sum of squares of the Fourier coefficients. It's equal to expectation of C of x squared, but C of x was minus one comma one. So the square of this is one, so the expected value is one. So technically this sum of squares is actually the square C of C hat of s squares is forming a distribution. Right, so the point is we just show by the simple identity that C hat of s squared, the sum of it is a probability distribution. And not only that, quantum examples allow you to sample from this distribution. So let's just say you have this uniform quantum example. So recall that again, I started this, lec this lecture by saying that I'm going to fix d to be the uniform distribution. So I had this one over square root two to the n, so position over x comma c of x. This is a uniform quantum example. There is a technique which you'll be doing the exercise. If you just apply the Haramards and if you measure, you can actually produce this quantum state. And if you just measure this quantum state, you're actually producing an s from the distribution c hat of s square. So essentially using constantly many quantum examples, you're actually producing this quantum state, and I can actually sample from the distribution c hat of s square. And as far as we know, classically, this is a hard task. Like if, if I just give you uniform uh, x comma c of x's, producing a distribution that's even close to this distribution c hat of s square, that is a hard task. It could, like, I mean, there are certain regimes where you can even prove that it's exponentially hard, but um, just in this example model, we know the sampling from this distribution is hard, whereas given uniform quantum examples, you can actually sample with it with constantly many samples. Good. So at least, okay, here is one subroutine which could potentially be useful. Given a Boolean function, I can sample from the Fourier distribution quantum efficiently using just like order one quantum examples, but classically, I don't know how to sample from the Fourier distribution. And as I said in the previous slide, this will be almost like a backbone of almost all known quantum speedups in a uniform distribution back learning. Good, so let me discuss some applications of uh, Fourier sampling and how it helps maybe learn some functions faster than the state-of-the-art classical algorithms. Good, the first thing I'm going to be looking at is the class of parities. 
So C1 is just a function where for every s, Cs of x is just the inner product between s and x. So this inner product is summation over i, si, xi, and the summation is mod 2. So s dot x is a number, it's, it's in 0 comma 1, and this concept class has two to the n many things, two to the n many concepts, each labeled by an unknown s, and Cs of x is just the inner product between s and x. So one thing it's, um, it's not too hard to show is if you're just given labeled example x comma Cs of x, the number of labeled examples necessary to learn the unknown s is omega n. In the exercise, you'll also be seeing why order n is, a, is an upper bound. And one more thing which is well known from, like although it's a very simple uh, subroutine, but Bernstein Majorani uh, observed this back in 93, is that if you just have like constantly many quantum examples, that is superposition over x comma C of x, where the distribution is uniform, constantly many quantum examples actually suffice to learn C1. So here's a concrete example where quantum examples are e exponentially better than classical examples. That is, order one quantum examples are sufficient, omega of little and classical examples are necessary. And you will be seeing um, in the exercise session both uh, this quantum, up both upper bonds classically and quantumly. So let's look at one more example. This is, some, this is slightly non-trivial now. This is called the class of Hunters. So C2, we, okay, C is just a Boolean function on n bits. We call it an L Hunter if C of x only depends on L bits. So let's just look at an example first. So C is defined on n bits, x1 to xn, but the function is so defined as x1 to xn is only defined on x1, x4, xn, only on three bits. So it's a three hunter. For example, C could also be x10 plus x2 times xn. This is again a three hunter. So look at the class of all possible Boolean functions that only depend on L bits. A priori, it could have depended on all n, n bits, but this is the new concept class I'm coming up with, where C2, where C2 is a class of all n bit functions where you're promised that the function only depends on L unknown bits. In this case, 1, 4, N. In this case, 10, 2, N, which is a three hunter. So this is a very interesting problem for classical, uh, for classical learning theory. And in fact, just the uh, regime where L is equal to log N and D is being uniform, like efficiently learning this has been a notoriously hard open problem. The best known algorithm we have is N to the log N. And coming up with a polynomial time algorithm for Huntas is has been a long-standing open question classically. So again, when I mean classically, I mean just given uniformly random x comma c of x, where I promise you c is just a L junta. We know that learning it, the best-known algorithm scales quasi in quasi-polynomial time, n to the log n. But surprisingly, you can actually learn this in, um, for it's, if it's an L junta, you can learn it with 2 to the L quantum examples and in time polynomial in 2 to the L. This seems exponential, but if you plug L equals to log n, this is polynomial in n, polynomial in n. So quantumly, you can learn juntas in polynomial time using polynomial examples, but classically, the best-known algorithm is superpolynomial in n. We don't know of classical lower bound, but the best-known classical upper bound is uh, superpolynomial in n for just L being log n. Good. So I'll be talking about generalization of both these concepts, and I'll give an algorithm for how to learn these. I'll give an algorithm for how to learn both these things, but before that, let me generalize both these things in the framework of Fourier sparse functions. Right, so we say a concept class C, a, a, a function C is k Fourier sparse. So if you just write down all the Fourier coefficients, there are two to the n of them, just write down all the Fourier coefficients and the number of Fourier coefficients that are non-zero is just at most k. So you have an n-bit Boolean function, you write down the Fourier decomposition, the number of non-zero Fourier coefficients is at most k, we call the function k Fourier sparse. And You'll be seeing this in the exercise again. Like if you write on the Fourier co coefficients of Cs, this is just there's only one non-zero Fourier coefficient, so C1 is one Fourier sparse. And again, C2, if you write on the Fourier decomposition of C, it's two to the L Fourier sparse. So essentially, you can just think of both bullets as just learning Fourier sparse functions for different parameters of k. Here k is equal to one. Here k is equal to two to the L. So let's just consider the learning the general concept class, script C, which is a collection of all Boolean functions, that is k Fourier sparse. And as I said earlier, C1 is a subset of this, um, because um, the number of Fourier coefficients of elements in C1 is one. And um, C2 is a also a subclass of this, when I pick L to be log k. Because if L is log k, the number of non-zero Fourier coefficients is k, and so it's a subclass of this. And I'm going to give you a subroutine. I'm going to give you an algorithm where I can learn script C in polynomial time in quant using quantum examples. Good. 
Good. So again, uh, we, we are restricting to this class, this concept class script C. is just a collection of all Boolean functions that are k for year sparse. And we would like to exactly learn. That is, I give you quantum examples. I would like you to identify what is the unknown k for year sparse function. And we are learning it under the uniform distribution as well. So classically, people have looked at this. So like a result of Haviv and Regev in 2015, they looked at this problem and they said, like, classically, the sample complexity of learning this thing is n times k. Recall that c is a Boolean function on n bits, and it's k for year sparse. So the classical sample complexity is n to the k. This is necessary and sufficient. And they proved a time upper bound of n to the power k. Good. Um, and one thing that we observed is uh, you can actually learn this concept class using k to the 1.5, just quantum examples of this form. So classically, again, you have these quantum ex classical examples. Quantum, you have these quantum examples. So just given k to the 1.5 quantum examples, it is sufficient to learn k for year sparse functions. And observe that this upper bound is independent of n. So the truth table could be exponentially long. But if I just promise you that it's k for year sparse, and you could think of k being much smaller than 2 to the n, classically, the sample complexity depends on the entire truth table size. Well, not truth table size on little n, but quantumly, it's completely independent of n. It just depends on the Fourier sparsity. So if you're promised the function is Fourier sparse, quantumly, you can get a much faster quantum speed up using just quantum examples. Let me give you first a tr trivial upper bound of how to get k square, and then I will get to a k to the 1.5, but I'll just give you a proof sketch. I'm not going to give you the complete proof here. So OK, let me first drive home the picture that more often than not, most of these quantum results that I'm going to be presenting here, essentially all that you're going to be observing is you can do Fourier sampling, then go to classical learning theory people. They provide you interesting theorems based on classical functions, use properties of these classical Boolean functions, and then in use it for your quantum results. And in this case, one thing we're going to observe is if c, c is k Fourier sparse, then classical people have proven that the Fourier coefficients are actually nice. So all these Fourier squared Fourier coefficients scale as 1 over k squared. And this is almost the most, from here, you can get a naive upper bound of k squared. So what do you do? You just use Fourier sampling. So I told you in the previous slide, given these quantum examples, I can, um, given these quantum examples, I can Fourier sample using order one copies. So using order one copies, sample an S from this distribution, C out of S squared. Now I know for a fact that this is k Fourier sparse, so there are only k many non-zero Fourier coefficients. And I know for a fact that each of them is pretty large. So if I sample an S1 from this distribution, it's going to occur with probability 1 over k squared. So I sample an S1, I get, a, I get something. I sample again, I'm going to get S2. I know that each one of these samples are going to occur with probability 1 over k squared. And now, again, using a kind of coupon collector argument, you can say that you can collect all possible Fourier coefficients of this non-zero, of this um, k sparse function using order of k squared samples. So take order of k squared many samples here, perform, do Fourier sampling on them, then use the structural property that classical people have proven, that c hat of s squared is at least 1 over k squared, and then show that if I just repeat the sampling process k squared many times, I collect all the non-zero Fourier coefficients. And then something that you'll be doing in the exercise is you can estimate all these Fourier coefficients using just classical examples, and all that can be done in polynomial time. So the overall sample complexity and time complexity is just polynomial in k. It's just order of k squared, maybe a little bit more, but it's polynomial in k. But the time complexity for the classical algorithm scales as n to the power k. So this is a trivial upper bound. Um, we can prove something slightly sophisticated, this k to the 1.5 upper bound, but um, I'm not going to get into the proof of that. Right, the sample and time is k square. So the idea is somehow like you, you might want to do something more than this, use this trivial lower bound of 1 over k square. You might want to use even more structural properties of k sparse Boolean functions. And one thing we observe is the following. So you just repeat the sampling process, and you keep learning a function, you keep learning the sub, take S1, and then take S2. You repeat it a certain set of times. We prove that after a certain set of samples, you actually learn the span of the entire Fourier support. So look at all the s for which c hat of s was 0, take its span, that is script v. So the interesting, that we sh interesting thing that we prove is it suffices to take the dimension times k many quantum examples to learn the entire Fourier span, where r is the Fourier dimension. And then again, we go back to classical, oh yeah, and, and once we get this thing, we, we, once we learn the entire Fourier span, you can actually use the classical result and get the rk, use the rk upper bound, and you get rk upper bound here as well. And it's necessary to upper bound R now. So for that, again, we go back to classical, lear classical learning or classical Boolean function analysis. And they've proven that for every case for your, for your sparse Boolean function, R is at most root k. 
So the classical sample, the quantum sample complexity is R times K, it's, and since R is at most root K, it's K to the 1.5. So this is, again, if this was slightly technical, what I would like you to take away is the following fact. This was a purely classical, as a result that people in Boolean function analysis proved for us. All that we did quantumly is we can see that we can Fourier sample, which is the main quantum observation here. And once we do that, we have to do some, again, bullet two is again a classical result. Bullet four is, a, sorry, bullet three and bullet four are just classical results. Bullet, just bullet one and two is something we do quantumly. And the fact is we're just doing Fourier sampling. And we conjecture the right upper bound is order K, but we don't know how to prove it. And we suspect that uh, there's an open question in Boolean function analysis that we don't know how to prove. Yes. Good. So once you learn this, right, once you learn this, you can perform an affine transformation. You can, ma you can make this entire thing. So perform a transformation onto the Fourier dimension altogether. So now, for example, it just depends on the first R bits. So once you learn the Fourier span, perform an affine transformation so that C prime only depends on the first R bits. And then just, to, just keep repeating classical sampling, you're going to get X comma C prime of X, where you know C prime is just an R bit function. You don't care about the final N minus R bits. Um, let me go to the second example where quantum examples are m much more interesting. And this was actually one of the first examples where quantum examples were much more powerful than classical examples. And that's for learning DNF formulas. So what's a DNF formula? It's just an R of and of variables. So let's just look at an example. So you can, this is an R, like this. This is an R and this is an and. So it's an R of two clauses here. This is clause one, clause two. And in each clause, you can just take an and of variables, x1, and x4, and x3 negated. And here you take uh, negated of x4, and x6, and x7, and negated of x8, negation of x8. So this is an R of ands, and any, any Boolean function that's representable as an R of ands is a DNF formula. And we say a DNF formula on n variables is S term if the number of clauses, so here it's just two clauses, but you could have many more clauses, it's at most S. Good. So the question is again, so you have this concept class and you promise that everything in this concept class is an S-term DNF. That means every Boolean function on n bits can be represented as an R of ands. And the number of ands is at most S. Here it's two. And the question is, can you learn this concept class with at most S terms under the uniform distribution? So the best known classical algorithm scales as n to the log n. It was pr proven by Verbigu. Uh, it was proven in the 90. Uh, and it's still been the state-of-the-art algorithm. We don't know any better algorithms for DNF learning if you don't make any further assumptions on DNF. Um, and it's a, in a long-standing open question. I think people conjecture that you can actually learn it in polynomial time just using classical examples, but we don't have a polynomial time algorithm yet. And Shuti and Jackson back in 95, they gave a quantum polynomial time algorithm for this problem. So for learning DNFs, again, the state-of-the-art algorithm scales as n to the log, log n, but quantumly, with just quantum examples, you can actually solve it in polynomial time. Let me give you a stretch of the upper bound. Um, and again, as I said, most of the hard work was done by a Boolean function analysis, and the quantumly, we just observed that you can Fourier sample. So the structural property that we need here is the fact that if so people have proven that if C, that's a Boolean function on n bits, is computed by S term DNF formula, in this case two, if you had more n terms, it's S, then there exists one large Fourier coefficient. So there exists one U for which C hat of U is at least one over S. This is given as a black box to us now. Good, so what do you do quantumly? You know only one trick, sample from the Fourier distribution. I give you quantum examples, you sample T from the squared Fourier distribution C hat of T squared. And you repeat this thing poly of n many times, poly of s many times, and eventually you're gonna hit a t for which c hat of u, sorry, you're gonna hit a u for which c hat of u was large, actually. So you keep sampling from the Fourier distribution, poly of s many times, you're gonna find a u for which c hat of u was actually large. And now this is almost good enough. Like from this, you can actually construct a weak learner. Because we know that c hat of u is at least one over s, it's not too hard to show that there, you can from that construct a hypothesis h for which h of x is equal to c of x is half plus s. And this h will just be the parity function on u. So what did you do so far? You had a quantum example, you Fourier sampled poly of s many times, say you found u, u appeared one, maybe twice or thrice, take u and chi u, which is your h now, actually has a pretty good 
not great, overlap with C. So it has half plus one over S overlap with the unknown function C, which is a DNF. But that's not good enough because we want, like if you recall the definition of packed learning, we want this to be at least two thirds. We don't want it so, like you could have just flipped a coin, that would have been half. This is slightly better than half, it's half plus one over S, but in packed learning or in general learning theory, you want to output a function H, which is at least two thirds close to the unknown concept. So this is getting you somewhere, but we don't know how to get it all the way. And this is where they use another technique that classical uh, machine learning people came about, is this concept of boosting. So boosting is something which was introduced um, by Freud and Shapir, where they said that if you have an algorithm that succeeds with probability that's slightly above half, you can always boost it to an algorithm that succeeds with, pro succeeds with probability two-thirds. So it's, you can think of it as a black, black box subroutine, but there is something I'm uh, sweeping under the rug here, but you can think of it as a black box subroutine that takes a weak learning algorithm, that is Fourier sampling, and outputting H to be chi u, which has bias half plus one over S. It takes this weak algorithm and produces a strong algorithm that has an overlap of two thirds. So this is boosting. So again, this bullet five is totally classical. Uh, bullet one is totally classical. All that we did quantumly was Fourier sampling. And we use this observation that there is a good overlap. And at that point, we're almost done. So essentially, the main quantum part in this slide and the previous slide is you can Fourier sample. And you can get a polynomial time quantum algorithm for which the state of the art classical algorithm is super polynomial. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. I think. I think these guys had like an S to the phi or S to the six, but there was a follow up paper by Shuti where he has S square or S cube. I think the sample complexity is polynomial in S, the time complexity depends on n comma s. Yeah. I mean, in, in complexity, like amplification means like different things as well. So boosting is just like it takes like an algorithm that does slightly better than random guessing, and it converts it to an algorithm that does two thirds. Maybe there's a relation between boosting and amplification as well, but it's just like, a weak algorithm converted to a strong algorithm. Oh, yes, 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 definitely. Thanks. Yeah. Oh. I think there was an algorithm like from last year or something, or a couple of years back, where they gave an end to the log S algorithm, uh, algorithm for learning DNFs. But this is like, like in the past couple of years. So if S is n, this is n to the log n. Good. Yeah, so I'll talk of the membership query model. Um, so yeah, so. Again, so again, C is a concept class of n-bit Boolean functions. C star is an unknown Boolean function in script C. And so again, in the classical membership query model, what you can do is the following. You can query C star. So earlier, in, so far, I just said like I gave you uniform quantum examples or uniform examples. But classically, let's just suppose like I can query C star on a point x. So you as a learner can give me x. I'll tell you what C star of x. You see that. You then tell me y. I'll give you C star of y, and so on and so forth. So this is the membership query model. The goal is always to learn C star, or maybe you can weaken it by saying output a H such that H is close to C star this way. And the complexity measures the total number of queries you make to C, and the sample, comp the query complexity of the concept class is like.
Okay, so you can hear me, right? Good. So in the classical query models, you can make X, you can query X, you get C star of X, and somehow in the quantum query model, you can make quantum superposition queries. Okay, good. So you can make quantum superposition queries in the following format. So you have access to this uh, unitary OC star that on input x comma zero provides x C star of x. And in particular, okay. in particular, um, if you can, for, you can feed it like a superposition x comma zero, and if you feed OC, OC star to this, you can pro, uh, prepare actually a uniform quantum example. So actually, these quantum queries are pretty powerful. They can not just make superposition queries, but you can also prepare quantum examples this way. So these are a pretty powerful model. And the goal is always the same. Given quantum queries to this, you would like to produce, um, you would like to learn C star either exactly or produce a H where C star and H are close. And the complexity measure, similar to the classical complexity measure, is classically the number of classical queries you make of this form, quantum in the number of quantum queries you make of this form. That's Q of script C. Good. Um, and the main open question, so the main question that we have here is like, can quantum queries, are they more exponentially efficient than classical queries? So given just classical query access versus quantum query access, is there a problem or a concept class for which quantum queries are like exponentially faster than classical queries in time or, sample comp or in query complexity? And the answer is no, actually. So the point is there's this very, uh, very nice result that says, like, so Q is at most D because quantum queries can always simulate the classical query. But the classical query complexity is always n times Q cube. So the best relation between quantum query complexity and classical query complexity is at most polynomial in n comma the parameter here. So it's, um, yeah, it's good to know that like, quantum queries do not buy you much more than a polynomial speed up than classical queries. And in particular, in the membership query model, quantum query queries can give you at most a polynomial speed up than classical queries. You could still get like Grover kind of speed up, so like you could get quadratic speed ups, or even like, for example, learning parities, Q is one and D is N, so this inequality is fine. But so you could get a one comma N or a Grover kind of speed up, but you could not get for like, you could not get for like uh, an exponential speed up when Q and D are non-trivial. Yeah. Good. So this is the best upper bound we can show, and we conjecture that the right upper bound is n q squared plus q. N Q square plus n times Q square. And the reason we conjecture this is because of Grover. You could just look at the concept class of just like the point functions. The quantum query complexity is root n there, and the classical query complexity is n there. So we suspect the cube can be made a square, but we don't know how to do it. So that's an interesting open question. So why is it different from Grover? I mean, there is no difference. Like Grover is one particular instantiation of a concept class for which you could get a quadratic speed up. But what we believe is that's the best kind of speed up you should be able to get for an arbitrary concept class. Good. Um, I didn't plan to go over it, but I can tell you quickly what's going on. So, the, so there is a combinatorial parameter that classical learning theory people introduced. It's called a greedy gamma parameter. So like, what would the best classical algorithm do? You, for example, I look at the concept class. I'm going to query an x, which rules out the most c's by making a query to x. Now, once I come to the subset of c's that are alive after I make a query, find the y that uh, kills the most y's, and so on and so forth. So I can introduce a gamma parameter and show that somehow like this gamma parameter is one over square root gamma is a lower bound on Q, and one over gamma is an upper bound on D because of this greedy algorithm I gave you. And that kind of does it. The proof is not hard, but I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't explain it. I can explain it offline. Good. Uh, let me go to the second part of the talk. Um, Good. So the point is, like we saw so far, that um, DNF formulas or shallow circuits or depth two circuits are actually quantumly you can get a exponential speed up compared to the classical state of the art algorithm. Can we extend the depth a little bit more? And for that, I need a three gates. One is the AND gate that is one if all the inputs are one. OR gate that is zero if all the inputs are zero. And majority gate it's one if the uh, number of ones in the input are more than n over two. And we say the a Boolean function on n bits is computed by a shallow circuit. 
uh, if, it can, if, if it can be computed by a constant depth circuit with the following format. So NC0 is a class of all problems that can be class class of all functions that can be computed by circuits containing of containing and or not. And not only that, the and can take in only two inputs. So this or can take in only two input, and can take in only two input, this and can take in only two input. So you can have not and or gates, but all of them have just two inputs fed to them. Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, uh, just a second, I'll get to that. So that's NC0. AC0 is when the fan-in is arbitrary. So here I'm just restricting the fan-in to be two, but for example, this R gate, uh, for example, this R gate takes in like many more inputs to it and so on. So this is like unbounded fan-in. For example, this top R gate took everything as an input here. So the fan-in to these gates could be arbitrary. That is AC0, so NC0 has fan-in two always. AC0 has unbounded fan-in. And the final thing we'll be looking at is TC0, where not only you have and or not gates, but you have this majority gate. So again, majority gate is just one if the majority of the inputs are at least n over two. So that's the majority gate. So we're going to be looking at NC0, AC0, and TC0. And these are very interesting classes even for classical learning theory, and we'll try to understand why quantumly there could be something or there could not be anything. So first, why consider NC0 and AC0? So I'm not going to be talking about these results, but there have been more than since 2018. 2018. So there was this breakthrough result of um, Bravi, Gossett, and Koenig, where they kind of said like shallow quantum circuits can do something that log depth NC0 classical circuits could not do. And there have been many, many results for like uh, in the average case setting for certified randomness, for um, randomness expansion, and so on and so forth, where people have shown that you can do something with a shallow quantum circuit, but you could not have done with classical circuits. And it kind of, or even like in the local model of um, communication, so it kind of begs the question, like, maybe like quantum circuits are actually pretty well understood, and they seem to be more powerful than classical circuits. Maybe could you have learned them also more efficiently? So maybe do quantum circuits give an advantage for learning? They did give an advantage for all these other tasks. Maybe they do give an advantage for learning as well. And this also would generalize the result of Shruti and Jackson, who said that you could learn depth two circuits. But more than that, we don't know yet. So that's why we looked at NC0 and AC0. And we looked at TC0 for another reason. Um, TC0 is a theoretical way to model neural networks. So a simple feedforward neural network takes in as input x1 to xn, and then you have all these sigma functions inside. You have all these sigma functions inside with weights w, 0 to wn, the weights could be exponential in n, and finally you output something here. And th there was this uh, seminal result back in the 90s. They showed that like feedforward neural networks are morally equivalent to constant depth polynomial size threshold circuits. So you could just, instead of, if you're not comfortable with neural networks, you could feed forward neural networks, you could just think of TC0 circuits, unbounded fan-in, and or not majority gates. And the question we kind of, the question we kind of ask is, do quantum resources, say if you have quantum examples, quantum membership queries, maybe if you just have quantum examples, do quantum results, uh, resources help learn the class of neural networks faster? So that was the, that was the motivation for looking at TC0. Uh, so let's look at a simple learning algorithm for NC0 first. So recall NC0 was um, the class of all functions on n bits, that is C can be computed by an order one, constant depth circuit with and or not gates with at most two bits, fan and two bits. So the simple, simple observation that we have is, is supposing the depth is D, and you know that all gates have fan and fan two, then the function could not have depended on too many bits. Because let's just say on the first layer, you had fan and two, the second layer you had fan and four, and it became 2, became 4, became 8, and so on and so forth. And depth d, although c was a function on n bits, it could only have depended on 2 to the d bits because it's depth d and the fan n is 2. Good. So we just observed that depth d and c0 circuits are actually 2 to the d juntas. And we know for a fact that learning juntas is notoriously hard for L equals to log n, or log n juntas are hard to learn. But as I said a while back, like juntas are actually efficiently learnable in quantum polynomial time. So just putting these two observations together, we observe that NC0 of depth d is just a 2 to the d junta. And if you just plug in the result of Atichi and Servadio, you get the runtime of their algorithms n times 2 to the 2 to the d. But d is a constant, because we're talking of NC0, constant depth circuits. So if d is a constant, this entire thing is linear in n, or at most polynomial in n. So in quantum polynomial time, you can actually learn NC0. And classically, we don't know how to learn NC0. The best known algorithm would scale as n to the n to the 2 to the d, or poly uh, I think it would be n to the log n, but yeah. 
So at least quantumly, we know how to learn juntas in quantum polynomial time. And so that's kind of promising. Like we wanted to learn NC0, AC0, and TC0. At least for NC0, we gave like an extremely fast quantum algorithm. It was in fact linear in N. So the next question is, um, can we move? OK, so the motivating question kind of is for the next 10 minutes is kind of like we, have, we wanted to look at constant up circuits. We first have bounded Fanon, that's NC0. We kind of said, OK, you can learn it in linear time. But for unbounded Fanon, we don't know what's going on. Uh, once you have unbounded fan and you have AC0 and TC0, where TC0 is majority, recall that these are the neural networks. So and you have this and this. And we can, in fact, go one step further. If you have depth two circuits, that's just DNF formulas, we know how to learn those as well in quantum polynomial time. So bounded fan in, we get a quantum advantage for learning. And for depth two as well, we know how to get a quantum advantage for learning in the example model. But once we go to depth three here, we don't know what's going on. And if you have TC0 depth two, we don't know what's going on. And for higher depths, we don't know what's going on. And let's just see what's known classically. So, so far, I just said, like, all this is, uh, I would like to understand these models in the quantum framework, but classically, what's going on? So just learning AC0 under the uniform distribution, the best known algorithm is we have this seminal algor algorithm of Lineal, Mansour, and Nissan in 89, where they show that you can learn AC0 circuits in quasi-polynomial time. OK. And essentially, the main idea, if you look at that, is kind of estimating the Fourier spectrum. So they kind of learn the, they observe some structural property about AC0 circuits that is concentrated well, and then they learn the Fourier spectrum in there. That's the first thing. And the second thing is after their result, or maybe a couple of years after their result, like Karitanov proved that actually their this end of the login algorithm is optimal. And not only did he show that it's optimal, he showed that it's optimal assuming factoring is hard. Now this already kind of hints that, okay, there is maybe something quantum to do here. Like, the crucial idea for this quantum uh, classical upper bound is estimating the Fourier spectrum. We know Fourier sampling is easy quantumly. And we know that this is optimal, assuming factoring is hard. But we know factoring is hard, again, quantumly easily. So maybe putting both these two things together, maybe quantumly we can, AC0 is learnable in polynomial time. Yeah. No, no. He's just saying if you have to learn it. They just, uh, I'll come to the proof, but it's just n not about learning the Fourier spectrum. It's just like unconditionally if you want to learn AC0 well enough. And how about TC0? Not much is known. Like even, up, even depth two TC0 circuits, only until a few, year, few years back, we'd, we knew some results about the hardness of learning uh, it under a uniform distribution. So in this fam same paper, uh, Karitanov also ruled out polynomial time algorithms for learning TC0, assuming factoring was hard. And there was a result by Clivens and Shurstov in 2009 where he showed, like, they showed that for pack learning, where you don't just need to learn under the uniform distribution, but you need to learn under all distributions, even depth two TC0 circuits are hard. So kind of that motivates the question, can we learn, um, can we learn AC0 and TC0 in quantum polynomial time? And we proved two results in this direction. And the first one is, so we're going to fix the uniform distribution and just given quantum query access, we show that um, if you can learn AC0 and TC0 any better than classical, so if you can improve n to the log n to anything better than n to the square root log n or anything of that sort, you can break learning with errors, which is like, so learning with errors, I'm not going to define the problem, but this is like the backbone of classical crypto systems. So we say that if you can have better learning algorithm for an interesting class of AC0 and TC0, you could have solved learning with errors in polynomial time, and that would be a breakthrough on itself. That would be a breakthrough. And the second result that we had a couple of years back is, OK, this is for arbitrary depth. We don't know what's the depth for which we can prove hardness. But just depth to TC0 circuits. So recall, we know how to learn depth to AC0 circuits, but depth to TC0 circuits, if you can have a non-trivial algorithm, and I'll define what non-trivial means. When I mean non-trivial, I mean anything other than Fourier sampling or just querying the entire truth table. If you can do anything smart quantumly, then you can have a breakthrough in complexity theory. So the way I would view these results is like twofold. One is this might be an evidence as to why we are not able to come up with better qu quantum learning algorithms for interesting classes. But on the other hand, also you could think of it being an optimist, like, OK, maybe if I can come up with something interesting, maybe that does have a consequence somewhere else. I think I'm very much running out of time. But uh, I'll try to go with the proof sketch, and then um, I'll try to stop there. Yeah, so let me, um, um, I'm not going to give you the proof of this, but I'll try to give you the proof of this. And I'll give you a high-level overview as to why learning implies something. Why uh, learning implies either circuit lower bounds or why learning implies you can break some crypto system. Right, so to begin with, um, you need the concept of pseudo random functions. 
So pseudo random function is script f. That's just a Boolean function. That's just a function that maps n bits to l bits. And there's a function one for error, the secret key. So for every k bit string that's a secret key, there is a function in the function class. And in this, for the slide, I'm just going to be using notation. So when I mean a to the f, that means script a, that's an algorithm. When I mean it, script a to the f, that means a can make queries to f. So given f, I give it Oracle access. I can make quantum queries, classical queries, whatever I want. So a is an algorithm that can make black box queries to f. And the point is we are not going to charge it. So it can do it for free, whatever it wants. But a should run in polynomial time. So we see a pseudo random function, uh, script f, is secure if it satisfies the following property. So script A, so the point is either I give it fs, where fs is coming from this uh, function class script f, or I give it u, where u is uniformly random, it should not be able to distinguish whether I gave it something from the function class or a uniformly random function with a good enough bias. In particular, so we say a function family f is secure if no polynomial time algorithm can distinguish whether it got access to f from this function class or uniformly random function. And if that's the case, we say this uh, function class is secure. So as I said, A cannot distinguish between a truly random or uh, Oracle U or a fake random function from this function class script F. And the point is, um, here the point is I assume that A makes classical queries to FS, but we say script F is quantum secure. If A can make quantum queries to script F or script U and still not be able to distinguish whether which of it it got. And as I said, like the, the main um, the crypto system that we're going to be using is the learning with errors problem. So this is one of the leading candidates for post-quantum crypto systems. And it, we don't know whether there exists a quantum polynomial time algorithm for it, but we suspect it's hard. Uh, the best known algorithms run in exponential time. And even if you had a sub-exponential time quantum algorithm, this would be a big breakthrough. And the hardness that I'm going to be proving in the next slide is I'm going to just be assuming polynomial time hardness, that is. Like forget even exponential time hard, uh, exponential time sub exponential time algorithms. Even if you can, we're going to be assuming that even just polynomial time is hard. Good. So let me tell you, th this is the main uh, the main subroutine that I'm going to be using, and this is kind of like what you should be taking away. Why learning implies something. So okay, I'm just uh, defining uh, what's a pseudo random function family and what it means to be secure. So first things first, this is not a Boolean function. Like More often than not, when we think of learning, we think of wanting to learn Boolean functions. So let's define this new uh, concept class, script C subscript F, where I just take the first bit of this output. So fs was a, uh, the output of fs was an L bit string. I just take the first bit. It's a one bit. So this thing, script CF, is just a concept class in the standard sense. So let's assume that B is an efficient learner for script C. So let's say that B is just a learner for script C. And we're going to devise a new algorithm, A, that does the following. So A is given Oracle access to either O or uniform. So it's A is either going to be given Oracle access to something from this function class or uniformly random Oracle. OK, so A is going to be my eventual distinguisher. So A is either given a function which is structured from this concept class, or A is given a uniformly random function. And all that we know is it, we know that there exists a B that could learn this concept class. So what does A do? A prepares a superposition and makes a query on O of x. Note that the goal of A is to kind of, the goal of A is actually to distinguish whether O was coming from this function class or O was uniformly random. So A prepares this thing, and it can prepare it efficiently with just one quantum query, passes it to the learning algorithm B. And whenever B makes a query, A can simulate. So when, exactly, when B makes a query, A can simulate it as well. So this is what happens. And we know that the learning algorithm, once it obtains many quantum examples and many quantum queries, because it's an efficient quantum learner, it will eventually output a hypothesis H. And what does A do? A says O is in CF if supposing the output hypothesis matches the Oracle query. So whenever B wants to make a query or B requires a quantum example, A kind of can make a quantum query or a quantum example to either O and CF or O being uniformly random, passes it to the quantum learning algorithm. The quantum learning algorithm outputs a hypothesis H, and A looks at the hypothesis H, makes one more query on a uniformly random X, checks whether H of X is equal to O of X. And this is going to be my algorithm. And the um, kind of small technical lemma that one needs to prove is if B is the learning algorithm that has bias beta, then A has bias alpha, uh, beta over 2. And in particular, the, if supposing beta is 1 over poly of n, A can serve as a distinguisher. 
in the sense that it can distinguish whether O came from CF or O was uniformly random, and it has a bias of 1 over poly in N. But that could not have been the case because we assumed that, um, like, the point is now we came up with an efficient quantum polynomial time algorithm A that could distinguish between a uniformly random function or a function from the concept class and with bias 1 over poly in N. That means we broke the crypto system, but then we assumed that that should not have been the case. So if A was a secure crypto system, you should not have been able to break it, but we started the assumption there is an efficient algorithm and we broke it. Yeah. Uh, I'll just come to the next slide. So the point is now this is like the subroutine and how are we going to use it to compute AC0 and TC0? So the starting point is to go to this uh, PRF function family given to us by Banerjee, Pycott, and Rosen. So they gave us a pseudorandom function family that is secure, assume, assuming the learning with error problem is hard. And not only that, they showed that what, okay, one thing that we can show is this uh, for every S, uh, Fs can be computed by a TC0 circuit. And in particular, every concept in our concept class actually could be computed by a TC0 circuit. And the main result that we have is if there exists an al quantum learner for CF, which is a subset of TC0, in particular the CF that is given to us by this paper, then there is a polynomial time algorithm for the LWV problem. So we look at a particular class of pseudorandom functions given to us by this paper, observe that it's actually implemented by TC0, and then show that, use the technique that we had in the previous slide and say, like, if you had an efficient algorithm for TC0, you would actually break this, um, break this PRF, but this PRF is believed to be secure, assuming LWV is hard. Uh, the similar idea, doesn't, similar, idea, similar idea doesn't work for AC0, um, so the, there, there is some uh, technical thing that we need to do, and somehow we also get a similar thing. We can construct also PRFs, which are also secure and show like uh, AC0 is hard. Uh, for you, you should not be able to get faster AC0 algorithms uh, quantumly. Yeah, let me conclude with the final slide. Yeah, so, uh, this, so this just proves the hardness of AC0 and TC0, but there are a couple of drawbacks of this. The first thing is, this is true even classically. It's just not a quantum problem. It's just that, for example, if you use this PRF approach that I had in the previous slide, for example, if you go to Karitanov's um, lower bound, they could not say anything about the depth of the circuits for which you could prove a lower bound against. So for example, none of the PRFs that Karitanov or some subsequent papers use, they could not implement these PRFs in depth le less than six. So we know depth two is easy to learn. We know hardness for depth greater than six, but what about depth two, three, four, five? And so this is uh, another result that we had where we can argue about depth two circuits even. So if C is a class of polynomial size circuit concepts that can be learned on the uniform distribution with bias gamma, then we show that you can actually prove that BQE or bounded quantum exponential time is not in the concept class. So if this is a little bit, um, let's just go over it a little bit slowly. So let's just see, for example, you have a concept class. What are the two trivial algorithms you can do? One, you just query the entire concept class. So I make two to the end queries, then my error is zero because I've exactly identified the concept class. So epsilon was zero, uh, that means gamma is half, and so this, this quantity is essentially two to the n, and my query complexity was two to the n. So I do the, there are two trivial algorithms, either I query everything that has time, that takes query and time two to the n, and the error was zero, that matches this, or I do Fourier sampling, because I can do that quantumly. So if I Fourier sample, I just take time poly of n, in fact, just apply a bunch of Hadamard, that's just n gates, and I measure, I get an S, I can just do Fourier sampling, but if I do Fourier sampling, my bias is just half minus two to the minus n over two. So gamma is two to the minus n over two, if I plug that here, this is just order one. And essentially it's poly of n. So essentially this main result is saying that if you can do anything more smarter than just doing these two trivial algorithms, that's what I mean by non-trivial algorithms, then actually you could prove a circuit lower bound. And as one particular application, one thing we can show is if you just look at depth two TC0 circuits, if there exists a non-trivial learning algorithm for TC02, then you get new circuit lower bounds. And as I said like before, there are two ways to think about this. This explains why maybe coming up with new learning algorithms is hard, or it gives a new motivation for providing new quantum speedups. Yeah, I think I'll stop here, but yeah, I think I'll stop here. <laughs>